a strong voice for Texas families and small businesses at the Capitol, State Representative Travis Clardy isn't afraid to stand up to the insurance lobby. Hailing from East Texas, he brings a sharp eye and common sense to crafting public policy that works for people. This session, he's leading the charge to protect policyholders. We are fortunate to have him join us today as our guest. I'm Ware Wendell, and this is Travis Clark in conversation. Representative Clardy, thank you for joining us on In Conversation. Good to be here, Ware. Thanks for inviting me. And tell me about District 11. I know you're in deep East Texas, uh, representing Nacogdoches. It reaches up to Henderson and over to Jacksonville. But give our audience a, a flavor for the House District that you represent. Sure. Happy to do that. So proud to represent House District 11, which is Cherokee, Rusk, and Nacogdoches counties. Beautiful part of East Texas. Uh, the only thing that excels the, the be natural beauty of, of this part of East Texas are the people that live in it. So it's a wonderful group of folks. Um, it's the home of Stephen F. Austin State University uh, there in Nacogdoches. <coughs> also uh, happens to be the, which is the oldest town in Texas. And I think pursuant to one of the bills I passed early on, maybe my first bill in, the, in office, the garden capital of Texas. But you swing around, you go up to uh, Henderson, uh, in Russ County, which goes all the way up to the southern edge of Kilgore, uh, a lot of uh, it's really that's an energy uh, capital of Texas. When you look at it, we have all all forms of uh, electric generation, which seems to be in the news a little bit these days. Uh, but the Martin Lake power plant there is a, a clean burning coal unit that we have, uh, which uh, was online uh, uh, and really above capacity throughout the, the recent storm. But also it's a home to a lot of natural gas. Uh, and, and oil production has been historically in the old East Texas field. You go over to Jacksonville, home of the Tomato Bowl, legendary football venue and high school football, and, uh, and also the Tomato Festival, which is coming up uh, June the 12th. Look forward to being there for that. Swing down, and uh, I'm going to decline that. Hope I didn't mess us up there. That's okay. Uh, uh, but you know, you go go around uh, uh, to, to go south to Rusk, which is the capital. That's one of the curious things about House District 11. You got the city of Rusk is the the, uh, the 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 county seat of Cherokee County, whereas Henderson is the county seat of Rusk County. So it's a it's a little bit confusing. Uh, but again, you come around to Nacogdoches, and it's just a, a great great district to represent. Always a lot going on, and I think the only problem we have is we have the Blueberry Festival in Nacogdoches, and traditionally, much to my chagrin, they're on the same day. So Judy and I will get up in the morning. We'll do the Blueberry Festival in Nac. Uh, wearing our blueberry t-shirts and then somewhere along the drive we'll change for our tomato festival t-shirts when we get to Jacksonville. But, there you uh, go. You know, it's, it's just because we have so many things going on. There's too much to do. I, I know it. And and having spent time in, in your district, it is just a beautiful, beautiful part of the state of Texas. For anybody who hasn't visited, I highly recommend it. It's just stunningly beautiful pine trees. And like you said, the best blueberries you're ever going to eat. So uh, remind me, you've been in the Capitol now several sessions. What was your first session and what brought you to, to public service? Yeah, good, good question. Uh, my first session was 2013, and that was the 83rd legislative session. Uh, so I'm now beginning or we're halfway through nearly our uh, my fifth session. Of course, we do two year terms uh, meeting every other year for 140 days. Uh, you know, so uh, that's that's what I've got here. Some folks in my district think we should meet two days every 140 years, but we'll go with the way we got it. It's been a, a, a good run. They've done a lot of, uh, you know, I think important things for the district, within the district, in transportation, with, with the improved highways, at the university, with the STEM center, with you know, any number of projects we've worked on. So it's been a it's been a really good, uh, good run, but still got work to do. So I'm uh, pleased to be back this session. And, uh, you know, and again, part of that deal is working on some of the bills that uh, I filed concerning uh, consumer safety and, and uh, consumer rights uh, dealing with uh, their automobiles, which are near and dear, uh, particularly when you get into people uh, caring about their pickups. Oh, for sure. And I want to talk a lot about that. The framers of the state, I thought, were very wise. They wanted us to have a part-time legislature 
They wanted us to have part-time legislate tours, folks who were very connected to their district, to the families that they represent, not professional politicians, not full-time politicians. So could you say a, a few words about your work? Because I know that you've done great work um, in our court system as well. Sure. Uh, I'm an attorney by profession. Uh, of course, we have other business interests throughout East Texas and own real estate and manage that and some uh, other uh, properties with uh, timber or, uh, you know, hopefully uh, a little better uh, uh, gas production, but we'll see as time, time will tell. But uh, as an attorney, I'm of counsel with uh, the firm of Holland and Knight, uh, which back in the way back days was uh, a Florida based uh, Southern firm, which has grown as really has a national, truly international presence. Uh, but it's worked well with my clients that I've represented for decades. I've been practicing law a license in 88, so I guess 33 years in November, which is hard to believe. Um, but, you know, my practice is always centered around representing businesses and individuals and civil litigation. Uh, I, I don't do any criminal law. I've never done engaged in family law, but it's really, uh, you know, protecting business owners, uh, physicians, hospitals, uh, you know, trucking companies, et cetera. So that's been a good background. And I think it's prepared me well to serve the legislatures, give me a broad overview of a number of different industries and, and sectors of our economy. So that's, that's worked well. Um, you mentioned something about the, the history of our, of our government, you know, two bills I'll just mention as an aside that are uh, getting a lot of heat right now and a lot of attention. Uh, one is HB three, which, uh, uh, deals, I think it goes the wrong direction uh, with respect to the power of the executive branch. And, and of course, we all appreciate the, the good work that Governor Abbott did in trying to manage the COVID crisis, but he took it upon himself because of concerns which were legitimate uh, to act, I will say unilaterally through executive orders and was making difficult decisions in a, in a, in a very difficult, uh, stressful time uh, and tried to get us through uh, that, that period that we're only now coming out of. That said, historically, Texas has always had a weak governor, a weak uh, executive branch. And I think that's part of what you said, that we have a legislature that's made up of citizen legislators. Uh, we intended not to have an overwhelming government presence uh, all the time. And I think that has served Texas well. So one of the debates on HB3 has been about uh, what powers uh, the governor does have and, and can constitutionally exercise and what limitations are there. And, and personally, I'm, I'm in favor of, of us preserving. I think that's my duty as a legislator, protect the legislative branch. We make the laws. Uh, it's the executive's role to enforce those laws and sometimes through agencies. But, you know, in my representation of East Texas, where we've had the most problems has been dealing with, uh, let's just say, overzealous uh, enforcement by some of our state agencies uh, who seem to want to take on uh, through, although we've delegated them some rulemaking authority, they have taken on more power and I think have skewed what their original intent of their agencies have been and is. Um, and of course that would include our uh, friends at the Texas Department of Insurance. I think we've seen them not uh, really focus on protecting the consuming public of Texas or the motoring public of Texas the way that I think they should. And so, but that, that goes across any number of areas, whether it be environmental controls with TCQ or with the comptroller's office and some of the uh, uh, tax enforcement or, or with HHSC and some medical issues. So again, it, it's not a perfect situation. Uh, and that's why it's important when we do come here every two years that we really focus in and get some things done. And, and in my mind, that it, it, as a lawmaking body, that we step in and assert our uh, absolute constitutional authority uh, and, and try to rein in any kind of government excess, whether it be too much taxes or too much government. I think that's the that's the job I was elected to do for House District 11. Well, I, I agree. Separation of powers is so important. And y'all in the legislature and in the House in particular, you're so close to your districts, right? You're really connected with the with the families in your district, the businesses in your district, you have your finger on the pulse of, of the people in this state. And I just want to say I appreciate very much your deep knowledge of the law uh, because we stand on the side of consumers and our courts, protecting our courts. And I've seen you time and again bring that knowledge to bear on, on pressing public policy issues. My take on you watching you through the years and working with you on a number of issues is you're just not scared of the insurance companies. Uh, you, you, don't, you don't ball up when they come for you. And I saw you in 2017 stand up against the blue tarp bill, the one that makes it harder for folks to 
to bring their claims if they've got a property damage claim that comes from weather, whether it's a hailstorm or a snowstorm like we just had in the state. Uh, so I saw you pushing hard on that. I've been in the room with you when you've been representing consumers uh, before the Texas Department of Insurance. You just mentioned them. So I thank you for, for taking up that charge because we know that people out there all across the state, we talk to them and we've done polling with them. They want to make sure that they're treated fairly. They don't want the insurance companies to get over on them because the insurance companies already have the power uh, in terms of writing the policies and taking our premiums. And then we need them to pay our claims when the time right. comes. And so I've seen you push for fairness in that space uh, every session that you've been at the legislature. And of course, you're doing that this session with these two bills that I want to talk about. But first, let, just let me say thank you for being a champion for policyholders, whether it's families or small businesses. We appreciate it very much. Well, thank you, Warren. I think that is an important position to take. And it was interesting, sometimes opposition or trying to inject uh, some ideas and to improve legislation um, oftentimes is not well received, uh, you know, by the, the insurance uh, industry. And but by the same token, um, my uh, legal career, uh, I have represented uh, insurers who have been sued and have taken those defensive positions. I'm a member, have been a member of the Trucking Industry Defense Association. One of the bills we I wanted to mention is, this, uh, I think it's HB 19, the trucking bill. Uh, and there are some things we need to do to, to, to level the playing field to make sure they're not abuses uh, on either side of the docket to make sure that's what our court should be, is to provide a fair, equitable, open forum so the issues can be resolved by the, by the litigants. And if they can be resolved amicably outside of court through settlement, great. And, but if we have to go to court that everybody knows that they're going to get a fair hearing, that that's, you know, that's really one of the cornerstones of our, of our democracy, uh, you know, and the, the, the right to the seventh amendment of having trial by jury is, is critical. It's one of the founders talked about it often in some of the federalist papers and some of the, the founding documents. Uh, it was important enough to put into the constitution itself. And so, you know, you look at the, the trucking bill, there's some things we can do, and, and I don't get too weedy on it, uh, but there are some things that, that uh, just, and I think the, the bill's being worked through, but I, as I've often said to people, you know, on these bills, I look at it very simply. I represent nearly 200,000 Texans in three East Texas counties, uh, and the, the vast majority of them pay checks, write checks, pay premiums to insurance companies. And they expect to get what they're entitled to under those policies, and rightfully so. It's a contract. It's a first-party relationship. But I look around my district, and I don't see any insurance companies. Now, I see some fine insurance agents who provide necessary policies to protect people's homes and businesses and lives, and, and that's the way it should be. So we need that industry, uh, and we need it to be fair. And there are some wonderful actors. There are some great companies that do exactly what they promised to do when they accepted the premium check, but there are others, not so much. Same thing within trucking. I'm very proud of our loggers and our, our companies, Tyson and Pilgrims and others that, that uh, are part of our transportation network that, that performed so admirably well through the recent storm. Uh, I'm seeing like Brookshire Brothers and how they were getting you know products to market so people had things to eat and getting water delivered. There's so many folks that do it right. They do it safely, they do it right, they hire good people, they maintain their equipment, have great policies. And, and care for Texans, uh, both in the mission of transporting goods, but also in being safe on the, on the public motorways. And uh, I think that's a reasonable expectation. So they're to be commended. But just like any other profession uh, or any other industry, you know, it's, it's 10 percent of the, of the actors, the bad actors that cause 90 percent of the problems. And so, you know, let's let's uh, let's don't make some big wholesale change, which. Uh, uh, you know, we, we should always work to make sure the playing field is level, uh, that part that litigants have a fair opportunity to, to develop their cases and try their cases. Uh, and in part of that part of that process is to make sure that the parties then have a better opportunity to, to have. They know what the parameters are to work out a settlement, and come to an, an agreement to, to resolve the dispute. But if you have it tilted one side or the other, it really is counterproductive. It, it harms the ability of parties or mo it fails to motivate parties to, to, to resolve matters themselves instead of counting on 12 strangers they haven't met and some, uh, some judge in a black robe. So, uh, you know, I, I think I'm hopeful that we will move that way in House Bill 19. And I'm really hopeful as we move through the bills that, that I filed on behalf of, uh, uh, you know, the, the American uh, uh, 
automobile body association of Texas uh, that, and, and also uh, with the appraisal bill that we will do the same thing that we will clearly delineate the department of insurance, what we expect and those insurance companies that they will play fair and work with their, uh, their, their customers, their policyholders uh, and my constituents uh, to, to, to do the right thing. And that's, that's what we should all strive for. Oh, I agree. I agree. I, I mean, our, our core values at Texas Watch are safety, accountability, and justice. And I think you can add fairness as the fourth to that list. Um, we're opposed to House Bill 19 as it's written because we feel like the version that we've seen so far would reduce the incentives for those good companies that you're talking about to keep us all safe on the roads. I'm worried about those truck drivers, too, who are pushed too hard uh, sometimes behind the wheel. And, um, and we are not anti-trucking company. We're not anti-insurance company at Texas Watch. I want insurance companies to be in this state. I want them to make a profit in this state. I just don't want them to make an excessive profit. And I don't want them to overstep their bounds like on this auto repair issue. So let's talk about House Bill 1131. This is your great legislation that deals with auto repair facilities. And the way I read it, and, and full disclosure, we worked together last session on this bill as well. The way I read it is it's basically allowing those auto repair professionals, those body shops who are doing the job the right way to do their job, to do their job free of interference from the insurance company, because we've seen, and I've, I've been on site with these, with these men and women, we've seen the insurance adjusters coming in and essentially dictating the repair in terms of how much money they'll, they'll offer or how much money they won't offer to make the repair. And then sometimes there are like manufacturer safety requirements that, that the body shop needs to follow to do the job the right way to do it safely. And the adjusters are saying, yeah, well, upstream in our corporation, they won't let us do it that way. We're only going to pay for you to do it this way. So could you talk a bit about House Bill 1131, what you want to sure. accomplish with that legislation, sir? Well, and you've touched on again, very good synopsis of the bill where, uh, but what we are trying to accomplish uh, and and let, let's back up 40 years. You know, once upon a time, you could have your shade tree mechanic and who could go to Napa or go to every part store and, and do basically nearly any repair that you wanted to make on an automobile if they had the right tools and had enough time and, and knew what they were doing. Um, that's far, far different than today's automobile. Um, anyone that has an automobile made even in the last 10 years, which if, and if you look at the cars that are on the road today, uh, it, it probably comprises 95% of the vehicles on the road today uh, have an electronic control uh, module, have a black box and, and a computer that operates many of the systems. Uh, it, it's not, a, vehicles are, are less and less mechanical uh, dealing with clutches and gears and, and, and uh, you know, the things that we're used to, with, um, and, but they are more driven by uh, the, the systems, the smart systems that make our cars better, more fuel efficient uh, and safer. So these have been improvements, but to, but then when there is an accident, there is something wrong with the car and they have to be repaired. You can't just, like I said, park it under the tree and get a wrench and fix it. And so what it requires is a, a high level of sophistication and the corresponding equipment, which does not come cheap. Uh, and the reason that's important when the manufacturers make the car, they, they say, here's how you make these repairs. This is what is necessary to be used. Uh, and, and there's a discussion ongoing about the OEM, original equipment manufacturer parts. No, but there are other parts that can be used, whether it be refurbished or, or aftermarket parts. But again, that's um, something that should be determined by professionals uh, in repairs and, and uh, not by people upstream and insurance companies. I, I'll tell you by analogy, you can talk to your physicians and doctors and uh, hospitals around the state, and you will hear a very similar lament that insurance companies are practicing medicine. They are telling you what procedures you can do or can't do, what tests can or cannot be performed, uh, how long a person can stay in a hospital. And they're not leaving it to the subjective, what I think best and most knowledgeable source and decision maker, and that is those physicians and, and those medical professionals who, sh who know the patient, who know what the problem is and know what's in their best interest. This has been a, and it, this happens throughout any number of industries where insurance is involved. And I think in a desire to maximize profits, and there's nothing wrong with profits. But uh, when it comes to repairing vehicles and, and with uh, House Bill 1131, 
it, that should be left to the professionals who've made the investments and have the experience to make those safer. Where it's most important has to do with a lot of our uh, warning systems that have been put into cars, the sensory systems, but also on those impact systems that have to do with uh, airbags and deployment um, and, and the structural integrity of, of the cabin, which protects the, the passengers, the vehicle. Uh, you, know, you can't just gloss over a bent fender and where there's a, a sensor and the paint may look fine. But if the sensor isn't repaired or made it checked properly, that may fail upon an impact. That can be true around the vehicle. We've seen this happen around the state where the repairs were made, where corners were cut, where, where the manufacturer's instructions on how to make these repairs were not followed, and it's led to some very tragic results. And again, it's an easy problem to fix. And it very simply, what 1131 does is it requires uh, that the, the repairs be made according to the manufacturer's specs and that those people performing the repairs be compensated for that uh, and paid for those repairs by the company who had promised the owner of the vehicle, we will make, we will make these repairs for you uh, because you have paid us, paid for the insurance. So it's a very simple concept. I've been disappointed. The Department of Insurance has, has said uh, that they don't have the authority, which I, I do not dis I do not agree with their assessment. I think they currently have the authority. I think it's clear in the code, uh, but they claim not to have that uh, either uh, authority or responsibility to, uh, compel the insurance companies to perform under the policies. So that is the reason we're coming forth 1131 uh, to make sure there's no question that the Department of Insurance can and should, uh, and legislative language shall uh, compel the insurance companies to perform as they promised under their, under their contract. Uh, I've, I've got this crazy notion in East Texas where people expect that if you got a contract, you're going to do what you said you're going to do. And that's, that's right. really what 1131 asks us to do. Oh, you're exactly right. And, and I like that medical analogy a lot. I think it's exactly right. I mean, you have a patient here who needs specialized care more and more these days in that our vehicles are rolling computers these days, in essence, right? right? And then you've got this managed care model where they're trying to say, well, we can, we can do this cheaply here or there. Uh, you mentioned the Auto Body Association of Texas. These are the men and women who do the job the right way, who train up their techs, who invest in the right equipment, and, and they need to be able to practice their craft because they are highly trained professionals. And we are relying upon them doing their job to the highest degree because I'm kind of a car guy. I bet you are too. Um, you know, you get the car back and, and the, the, the fenders are buffed, right? And everything's shiny and it looks straight and there's no gaps. I can see all that. But I don't have the equipment to run the scan to make sure that right. the sensors are working correctly. And I don't have a lift to make sure that that frame is straightened uh, the right way. And so that it's going to stand up for me if, God forbid, I get into another wreck and I don't have a catastrophic failure where now my family is, is injured. So, so it's a great bill. As I read it, you know, it allows you to have quality parts used, number one. Right. Um, at a quality shop of your choice and, and making a quality repair that follows those manufacturer specifications. So basically, I mean, we have a right as consumers to have the car returned to quote, like, kind and quality. And that's what your bill does. It just simply says, get the car back in the shape or the truck or the SUV, the van, whatever, back in the shape it was and let's get on back on the road. So right. it's a very common sense bill. Well, it's been frustrating. We have seen so many anecdotes and so many documented cases uh, of where there's a, a, a practice of uh, steerage, of steering people away from the quality shops because they are more expensive. Let's be very clear about that because it some it takes more money to do a job right. Uh, you know, it's cheaper to fix something with bailing wire and duct tape than it is to do it right. But if you want to have your car and have it back to the condition it was supposed to be in before the accident and you paid for that insurance to make sure that occurs, again, that was the bargain that was struck. Uh, but the insurance companies all too often have companies that are either that are owned or controlled by the insurance company. And they they sometimes uh, uh, in a more nuanced way to steer people towards those, but sometimes in a very direct light. And I think, you know, in a way that's contrary and violative of, of Texas law. There's a law against steerage by insurance companies, but it's, it happens nonetheless. And we have stacks and stacks and stacks of cases where we know that has occurred. Um, that needs to stop. 
uh, again, and, and that it, there, you know, there may be those situations where a consumer says, no, I don't, you know, I want to go to this place because I can get my car back faster. I'm not trying to take that option away from uh, a consumer. If that's what is more important to them, I believe everybody gets to make their own choices. Um, but fundamentally, they should not be discouraged to go to a shop who can really do the high quality repairs. And conversely, they also should not discourage those uh, those uh, quality shops and the members of ABAT uh, who actually do the, do it right, even to their own financial detriment, who, who do work that needs to be done because it's necessary to make that car safe. And they do it out of their own pocket rather than cutting that corner, which they're frankly are motivated to do by the insurance companies. So, you know, let's focus where the, this is. This is a safety issue. Let's keep our focus there. Uh, and we can deal with the, the financial, you know, uh, fallout from it later. But I truly don't think there's going to be a, a large fallout. I don't think it's going to necessitate or, or cause insurance premiums to go up. Uh, I think what it will do, it may cut into some of those marginal profits that the insurance companies will make by cutting corners. And that's what they, they shouldn't be doing. And people should get the benefit of their bargain when they buy, buy their insurance policy. So uh, I'm excited to bring 1131 again. Uh, I do expect that hit some headwinds as we always do. Uh, but uh, we're going to fight the good fight for the people of Texas. You you and I are not afraid to charge up the hill. And as I look at it, just having worked on insurance issues for a number of years, I think that we could see a, a reduction in the severity of claims because if that truck or that car stands up for you in that next right. wreck, right? Now your body is not injured to the same degree. You know, it's a lot easier to fix a fix a car than to fix me or to fix you or to fix our listener. And so those bodily injuries should go down, should save the insurance companies some money and all of us some money as, as, as right. policy holders, as rate payers. Well, and, and all the engineering that the automobile manufacturers have done through the years, you can go all the way back to Lee Iacocca saying we need to put seat belts in cars as standard equipment um, and come forward. But all the engineering to make these things safe, to have these uh, active systems that uh, deploy airbags and the structural integrity of the cage and, and all those things that have been done. It just doesn't make sense to throw that engineering and that, that, that uh, just incredible, incredibly good work and, and safety components out the window because we want to cut corners. And you make a great point. You cut corners. If the cage doesn't absorb the, the kinetic energy of a, of, a, of, a, of a collision, it's going to get to the occupant of the vehicle. And, and our frail bodies, as strong as we may think we are, don't do well when we're involved with collisions of, of tons of metal and steel hurling towards each other at, at uh, you know, hundreds of miles an hour in a combined uh, uh, accident. So we, we have to utilize those things. We have safer vehicles than we've ever had. Why do we want to turn our back on that engineering and make it any less safe just so we can cut some corners and, and save some nickels and dimes? Uh, for the insurance company when they don't want to pay the claim. Well said. Well said. I want to talk about one more bill. You've got a lot of great bills this session, but I want to highlight House Bill 2534. This is a bill that deals with an insurance process called appraisal. We've been talking about this more with our audience. This is intended to be a pre-dispute resolution process, pre-litigation process, meaning we should be able to hammer out an agreement with the insurance company as to the value of the loss. What does it cost to replace the roof or whatever the issue is with a car? What does it cost to replace the fender? What's the right number for that? And the insurance companies fought to get this in the policies years ago. And again, they write the policies. We don't get to negotiate right. that. This is a take it or leave it contract. We as lawyers, we call that a contract of adhesion, but it's a one way street, basically. So we don't get to, to choose that. And so they got it in the policies, but what we've been hearing through the years is that some of the companies, I'm not going to say all, but some of the companies are playing some games with that process. So they may, they may hang back. They may force you to get all the way to hiring a lawyer, getting all the way through discovery where you're learning about what happened in the case, get all the way to mediation where now you're trying to negotiate a settlement with the help of a third person, a mediator. And now the insurance company says, no, we don't like the, the number that's on the table. Now we're going to go to appraisal. And of course, right. that, that causes you to spend money, thousands of dollars in some cases, time. And I don't think that's fair at that point. We need to do that process early on 
in, in the life cycle of the dispute. So could you talk about House Bill 2534 and how it's going to help us gain clarity here and how it's going to help policyholders, whether they are families or small business owners? Well, we're one of the expressions I learned when I came to East Texas and started appearing in courts there was the old uh, adage, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. <laughs> and and I think that applies to this bill. And as you pointed out, the appraisal uh, uh, clause was put in there basically through insurance input back in the day. And the way insurance policies are written, uh, there's a, a organization uh, ISO insurance standards organization, which comes up with model language. And again, that makes sense. You want to have uniformity and consistency around the country. Uh, and I think particularly in automobile coverage, because uh, vehicles do move around and you need to have kind of, you know, apples to apples as you, as you move around the country. Um, but on, on this, uh, though that their that language is drafted and the appraisal language was put into the, into the uh, model statute, which is adopted by the state of Texas, those policies are approved by the State Board of Insurance in Texas and then are supposed to be enforced and interpreted uh, by that body. Now, of course, they can have judicial interpretation uh, if it goes into the courts, but that, as you point out, is a very expensive process. Uh, and... Everybody knows this, uh, but insurance companies know this uh, uh, very well, uh, that while people may be motivated to get their issue resolved, if it's worth a few hundred dollars, a few thousand dollars, sometimes the juice isn't worth the squeeze. Um, sorry about that, a call coming in, but you know, that, right. that they know that if a claim is small enough, uh, and it's relatively hundreds or thousands of dollars, that people We'll just have to let it go because they can't fight the big insurance company over that amount. And so it, it provides a, an uneven playing field. And again, you, you've heard me say this in other contexts. This is an opportunity for us to uh, address the law and give that same right to both consumer and insurance company. And there are times there are legitimate differences of opinion on what ought to, ought to have to happen. I am not saying that every consumer is always right and every insurance adjuster is always wrong. Um, the truth, like most things, is somewhere in the middle. And uh, there are some, so, so, you know, take this for what it's worth, but it seems to me that both parties should have the ability to trigger, um, and I think the trigger we have within the bill is drafted, is a 90-day trigger to say, let's go to appraisal. And it's, it's uh, a form of uh, alternative dispute resolution where there's an independent appraiser who looks at the evidence both sides and makes a decision quickly, promptly, and with knowledge and experience of vehicles. And I think it's a good way for us to keep things out of the court, but also get to a quicker resolution and where people don't get uh, walked over on their claims and conversely, where insurance companies can, can make sure they're not um, you know, having their cost of claims driven up because we all know this, that also hurts consumers. We don't want to see uh, insurance costs driven up so premiums have to go up. That's not the goal whatsoever. But we need to have it where, where it's fair uh, and it's open uh, and it's, it's timely. That's right. And we get right back down to fairness uh, on that bill. And I think it's just, it makes a lot of good sense to me just to know where we all stand early on in, in the course of the dispute. And hopefully we can resolve the dispute that way. Right. So I think it's a great bill. Uh, we look forward to supporting you on that. For everybody uh, in our audience, you have the opportunity to weigh in with your lawmaker in support of House Bill 1131 and House Bill 2534. You just need to go to texaswatch.org. We have it up on the uh, insurance reform page. So you just go to projects, hashtag insurance reform. You're going to have the opportunity to act now. You'll see the button to do that. Or you can go to our act page. And we make it easy for you. It literally takes 30 seconds. All you have to do is type in your name and your address. Uh, you don't even have to know who your state senator is, who your state representative is. It populates all that information for you. You can change the letter any way you want to, but we have a draft letter there for you. Click send. And it's really important, having worked in both chambers of the Capitol, for, for these offices to hear from y'all. They want to know what you care about, where the intensity of that support is. And so take 30 seconds to do that and then tell your friends to do it as well. Uh, I like to say, send it to your family email chain. Uh, if, if you're on social media, post it up there as well. And that's valuable feedback for folks like Representative Cardi who really care about the people in their district and the people of this state. So please uh, take, take action there, texaswatch.org. 
Uh, you can learn more about Representative Cardi's background on the Texas House of Representatives site. We'll put that link in the, uh, in the, in the episode notes here. And Representative Cardi, for those folks who are listening to us on our podcast right now, they may not know, while we're both sitting down, and I'm not short, I'm pretty tall, you're about a head taller than I am. So uh, I'm, I'm going to tee you up here. Uh, you played some college ball, basketball. Do I have that right? Well, I, I did. Uh, I, I happened to be, I may have shrunk a little bit where I'm getting older, but uh, six, seven, uh, to my knowledge, and I claim this proudly, I think I am the tallest legislator in the history of the state of Texas. We have some here, they're six, four, six, five. Uh, but to my knowledge, nobody's ever served us any, any taller. So I'm always proud to stand tall for Texas. Um, but back in the day, uh, way back in the day, it's a little bit after Peach Baskets, but uh, uh, not too far <laughs> after. Uh, played basketball at Abilene Christian University. I'm very proud of my Wildcats. Uh, uh, for the second time in three years, have made the big dance uh, and are slated to play the Longhorns of the University of Texas. You're, uh, I think this coming Saturday. Long, you're going to be playing my Longhorns. And uh, as a student of the game, and I used to play a bit myself, I do have to say I love Abilene Christian's style of basketball, and I think it's going to be a very spirited contest. So, so we'll have a friendly rivalry here this weekend. There we go. Well, I'm I'm taking the cover and cats on this one, so <laughs> we'll we'll see if they can do it. But but where I just want to thank you for inviting me on the show. I appreciate everything you do at Texas Watch. Uh, the opportunity to come on here, and and uh, I would echo your sentiments to the people watching to to let your legislators know your your reps and your senators. Uh, and it does mean a lot to us. I speak for all of us that we love to hear from our constituents. It means a lot. We record, we keep up with the calls and the feedback that we get, and that does inform our decisions. You know, that's the job. As I tell folks all the time, the title of my job is representative, uh, and that that is what I do. That's a that's a you know, representing is a verb, not a noun. And so I'm I'm uh, proud to do that. But uh, appreciate you bringing this this attention to light. Uh, and look forward to seeing you hopefully around the Capitol now that uh, we're having a few fewer restrictions. Uh, but but it's uh, like I said, I'm very pleased to carry these pieces of legislation and look forward to seeing you all soon. And thank everybody that's watching or listening uh, to uh, paying attention to this. It is important. These are important issues. It, this affects real lives in a real way. Um, and so, you know, every every uh, shoulder to the wheel will help. And let's push this thing over the finish line. Most definitely. Thank you for your leadership on behalf of families and small businesses in the state. Thank you for standing tall for Texans. And we appreciate your time and joining us here on In Conversation. Thank All right, you. Thank you, Go Cats. All right. Take care. All right. Bye-bye.